Spanish Dominion. So after Cortez's conquest of the Aztecs, Pizarro kidnaps the Incan Emperor. He captures the Emperor, forces him to surrender and convert to Christianity. In return for his conversion, he's granted a merciful death by strangulation, rather than a painful death by burning at the stake. What's left of the Mayans, who had already for the most part collapsed, were conquered. When the Spanish set up their colonies, they established what's called the Ecomienda system. Under this system, the natives were often subjugated to forced labor, basically made into a slave labor force. Millions perish from disease that the Spaniards bring with them. The Spanish also bring back immense wealth in gold and silver from the conquered Aztec and Inca empires, as well as the remnants of the Mayan empire. So the Portuguese, now the Portuguese are more preoccupied with Asia for the most part. They're dealing with trying to set up trade with India and Japan and Spice Islands, and they care little for the Americans. However, they do manage to secure one South American colony, Brazil. Now, Brazil turns out to be perfect for sugarcane. And at first, their strategy is to enslave the natives and use them as a slave labor force. However, many of the natives know the land far better than the Portuguese do and escape into the dense Amazon jungle, never to be enslaved again. Others simply die from the diseases that the Portuguese bring with them. The Portuguese solution to this conundrum is to begin importing enslaved Africans since the Africans will, one, um, they already are used to the same diseases as the Europeans because African cultures also keep livestock animals. And so many of those diseases made the animal to human jump, just as they did in Europe, and so Africans already had an immunity, just as the Europeans did. The other issue is that these Africans would not know the land very well, and so less capable of effectively running away. And physically, they appeared quite distinct from both the natives and from the Europeans who brought them, which made it harder for them to hide in plain sight. So French colonization. So the French also begin colonizing in the Americas. Despite the Treaty of Tordelier's, which gave the Spanish and the port gave the Spanish most of the Americas and the Portuguese Brazil. The French, nonetheless, emerge anyway. The French mostly are fur trappers. And what this was was the French fur trappers were looking for uh, beaver skins, beaver pelts, which were valued for making hats of the other, particularly the tricorn hat and later on the top hat. And they would often hunt for the beaver pelts but they would also trade with the natives for those pelts. The Native Americans would hunt the beavers, and then they would sell the beaver pelts to the French in exchange for items that they wanted. Muskets, iron tools, whatever it is they wanted to buy from the French, they would buy that in exchange for beaver pelts. Now, many of these Frenchmen came as single fellows looking to make their fortune and as a result, single fellows get lonely, and they tend to uh, develop relationships with the women who are around. And as a result, there was a great deal of intermarriage between Native American women and male French fur trappers. So this tended to bring the natives and the French into a much closer relationship, as there were a large number of families that soon grew up in the New World that were basically had were a mix of both cultures. Now, French Catholic missionaries came over as well, just as Spanish Catholic missionaries came over, and many of them worked to convert the natives to Catholicism. Now, Dutch colonization. Now, the Dutch didn't make a whole lot of headway in the New World. They only established one colony, which was uh, New Netherlands and New Netherlands would eventually be conquered by the British and would become New York. Now, they were mercantilists, so that meant is the Dutch were more concerned with what's called mercantilist economy. So in a mercantilist economic theory, 
it's believed that a country's benefit is to try to amass wealth by getting as much gold bullion as possible. And the way you acquired gold bullion was through a favorable balance of trade, which meant that you wanted to export more than you imported so that other countries would be forced to pay you the difference in gold. And as a result, as many countries began to develop colonies because of the fact that colonies were one, they were a source of raw materials, they didn't have to buy raw materials from other countries, and they were a captive market. You could, if you made too much of a certain good and you couldn't sell it abroad to other countries, you could always sell it to your colonies. Now, the Dutch also had a very seigneurial system, that's to say that instead of small plots being granted to individual families, the Dutch crown gave large swaths of land, miles upon miles of land, to various elite noble families who would become landlords, like the Rensselaers. Have you heard of Rensselaer County? That comes from that, that large tract of land was given to the Rensselaer family, and they owned it as their own personal land that then they would rent out to tenant, to tenant farmers and charge them rent. English colonization. So, the English are the latecomers in the American colonization game. Of all the European powers to start setting up shop in the Americas, the British actually come the last. Now, they settle several different colonies, which is one of the things very confusing. So New England is settled by Puritan refugees fleeing religious persecution in Britain, just as Maryland is settled by Catholic refugees fleeing religious persecution in Britain. However, other colonies are founded by royal patents, such as Virginia. Georgia is even founded as a debtor's colony. And many are explored by what are called joint stock companies, which are the origin of, which are the predecessors of modern corporations. A joint stock company was a legal entity where the various members owned only a piece of the company whose stock. This was a valuable way to to host expeditions because of the fact that if the expedition didn't end up bringing back much of monetary value, it's not as if one person lost everything funding that expedition. So the problem with the British. So the big reason why the British have probably the rockiest relationship with the natives is because most of them were farmers. So why does it cause problems? Well, Clear, if you want to farm, you've got to clear the land. You've got to cut down all the trees. You've got to remove the forest to farm. Problem is, the natives want that for hunting land. If any of you guys from up here probably know, Mr. Quick, you can, if you're here in class today, I'm sincerely hoping you are, can attest, you don't like it too much when people mess with your hunting land. Hmm? All right? All right. Anyway, so as a result, natives get pretty angry. And that causes conflict between the British natives. This conflict only gets worse as time goes on, because as time goes on, um, the Puritans have a belief in predestination. So remember, the Puritan predestination belief was that at the beginning of time, God had selected a few elite souls, the elect who were to be saved, and everyone else was damned to hell. And the problem with this is that, to them, most of the people they believed were saved would already be members of the Puritan religion. So they looked at these natives who were not yet Christian, they weren't Christian at this point, as damned souls that were in league with the devil and thus deserved to die. So this became an issue because they didn't work, unlike the, a lot of the Catholic missionaries that saw the natives as a source of converts, people to be brought into the religious fold, the Puritans saw them as an enemy to be eliminated. And that tend, when someone says they want to kill you, you tend not to be too nice to those people. So that is the problem with the British, and that's where we're going to end for today. Thank you so much.